Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest, Preston Dennett. Um, he began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 86 when he discovered that his family, friends, and coworkers were having dramatic and unexplained encounters. Uh, since then, he has interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He's an investigator for MUFON, has written 30 books, and uh, several of his books have been Amazon UFO bestsellers. Um, I'm not going to go into his numerous magazine articles that he's been involved in, but uh, his writings have been translated into a number of languages. And he's appeared on numerous radio and television programs. And his research has been presented in the LA Times, LA Daily, Daily, LA Daily News, Dallas Morning News, and other newspapers. He's taught classes on various paranormal subjects and lectures across the United States. And his website is www.prestondennett, that's with two N's and two T's, dot weebly.com. Welcome to tonight's show, Preston. Hey. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, not everybody will uh, come on to my show, but uh, I do appreciate your being on. So let's just jump right into it. Um, we could go as much as you're a researcher, we could go in a lot of different directions, but because you're an experiencer, direct uh, experience is always the most exciting. So I would like to um, but but I don't want to start with your ET experiences. I want to start with your uh, very first experiences. Now, I'm not going to say what those are because that's something I don't know, but I, I don't distinguish between uh, aliens and the paranormal. It's all the same thing to me. So just start at the very first strange odd or unusual thing that ever happened to you and then keep going through those until you run out <laughs> <laughs> all right well um there's a lot actually uh, it kind of started out slowly for me and once these things start happening to you and you start realizing that there are ufos because i came into this field as a skeptic with not only ufos anything paranormal I started looking back into my past to see if there was anything strange going on. And I did find some things. And probably the first that really stuck out for me was around age nine. I would say it could have been up to 11 or 12 even, but I'm guessing around age nine, I was in the living room with my older sister, Victoria, one year older than me. And we were watching a game show called Treasure Hunt. Uh, which is your typical game show. And I just suddenly had this weird knowing feeling about who would be picked out of the audience to play. I turned to my sister, I'm like, it's going to be that lady, see her? <laughs> um, she's out there in you know, whatever row it was. And sure enough, she was picked. And they go through this whole sort of procedure on this game show. They lined up three contestants and said, okay, we want you to pick the canister that has the flowers in it. These were closed canisters. And I'm like, it's that third canister. I know it is. And of course it was. And my, me and Victoria just laughed and laughed. And it just kind of went on. I knew all the answers to this game show. It was insane. And I wasn't thinking paranormal at the time. I didn't know how to explain it. I just thought it was strange and funny. But the last part of it, I'll never forget, was the stage was filled with boxes. About 80 of them under 100, but I think it was 70 or 80, all different sizes, some tiny little boxes, some quite large, all numbered. And one of them had the check, which was, I think, 50 or $100,000, somewhere along those lines, in it. And the contestant had to guess which box the check was in. And I'm like, it's this one. <laughs> no, I don't remember the number. It was a higher number, 70 or something, 73. I'm like, the check is in there, Victoria. I know it is. And she, the contestant, guessed the wrong box. And they're like, oh, sorry. And then they opened up the box that I had listed, that I had mentioned. And, of course, the check was in there. 
so yeah, that was my first real psychic vision, I guess, or clairvoyance or premonition, perhaps you might say. And I pretty much dismissed it, didn't think about it. I always reminded my sister over the years, you remember this because you're my witness. And to this day, she's like, yeah, I remember it. Uh, so that was the first one. And really nothing that I can point to for a long time until I found out UFOs were real. And that was in 1986, because I heard a report in the news about it setting over Alaska and remembered that my brother claimed to have seen a UFO, my older brother, Mark. You know, I didn't believe him at the time. That was some years earlier when I was like 13 or 14. Uh, but now I'm 21 years old, 1986. And Marco describes to me this incredible sighting. And I found out that my sister-in-law had had a sighting, my other sister-in-law, uh, people at work, several friends. So this is how I became interested in UFOs. And it was all well and good to hear other people tell their story and read books about it. But I really, really, really wanted to see one myself. And I, I was interviewing people. Uh, pretty soon I was going on the radio. I was writing articles. So I was diving deep into this. I bought every book I could find, joined every UFO group. And it was around, I was investigating this major wave of sightings in my hometown, Topanga. At the time I was living in nearby Canoga Park. But I was at my brother and sister's house in Woodland Hills. This is in late July of 1992, July 20th or so. And it got late. We were talking about UFOs, of course. And <laughs> I'm like, I have to work tomorrow, so I'm gonna go home. So this is in Woodland Hills, a very densely populated area in Southern California. And I left their house. This is just before midnight. And I'm driving down this little street called Gullandrina. It's a very small residential street. I'm coming around this hairpin corner, which is so tight and so steep, you can't go fast on it any more than five miles per hour or so. And as I was you know, maneuvering this corner, something caught my eye. And uh, it was sort of what I thought was a bird, actually, at first, though this is late at night. And it was glowing. And I looked up, and it's about 300 feet up to my right, in a swooping parabola towards me. And my second thought was a firecracker, because after all, this is late July, and people were still shooting off firecrackers occasionally. Uh, but it was instantly clear to me this wasn't a firecracker because it dropped down in front of my windshield, right over the hood of my car, and stopped a foot away. And I thought for a split second, could this be a reflection, even though I knew it wasn't, because it was a little orb about the size of a golf ball or maybe a ping pong ball or tennis ball, you know, they're about uh, kind of a soft yellow white, but hard edges. And it was clearly intelligently maneuvered because it was just hovering there. <laughs> And I felt had a sense it was looking at me. I mean, it was right in front of my face. It was looking at me. And then it darted to the left, then swept back to the right, all the way to the edge of the windshield, back again, and then came right in front of me and stopped a second time. L was looking at me, I, I felt. Scooted forward, dipped down, almost scraped the asphalt and went straight up. The last thing I remember was gripping the steering wheel and staring up at this thing as it disappeared through the canopy of the trees and up into outer space and gone. So that was kind of my first encounter, and I forgot about it. I compl it completely left my mind. And that was really interesting to me because I had interviewed a lot of people who had described that to me. I'm like, how can you forget <laughs> you know, when a UFO is chasing you down the road or landing outside your house or in front of you on the highway? And they're like, I don't know, it just left our mind. We didn't talk about it. Well, that happened to me, so now I get it. And it wasn't until some months later, less than a year, that I did remember, just kind of dropped into my mind. But I don't remember driving home. 
I should have turned around and told Mark and Christy, my brother and sister-in-law, that I just saw a UFO. <laughs> this is amazing, which I didn't do. Uh, so I think I had missing time. And uh, I don't okay. know what... Okay, stop. <laughs> you caught my attention. All right, so... Um, you say you think you had missing time. How did... Why do you feel you had mi missing time? What did you... Um, did you look at your watch when you were looking at it and then you looked at it again? Or no. what gave you the impression that you uh, had missing time? Because I don't remember what happened after I saw that light. I don't remember driving home. I don't remember going to bed that night. Okay. Um, and I would have, because I've seen UFOs since many times. It's always thrilling. And I write it down, I call people up, I'm very aware of what happens afterwards. And I had nothing, zero memory, uh, which, yeah, it's not that unusual. I mean, this happens. We know this is UFO researchers, and certainly experiencers. Have you, uh, have you had a desire to recover your missing time? Absolutely, yeah. I have not sought hypnosis or hypnotic regression. I've considered it, but having interviewed a lot of people who have done that, uh, and there's a lot of people who remembered spontaneously uh, through meditation or just a, a cue perhaps will trigger the memory. Right. I would prefer that because a hypnotically re retrieved memory comes across as just that. It's hypnotically retrieved. It's different. I think it works. Hypnosis does work. Well, have you been hypnotized at all? No. Okay, so no. what? Um, when I first went to get hypnotized, I uh, do you know who John Schusler is? I do. Okay, so um, he took me... Um, he was, I think he, uh, made public the Cash Landrum case, uh, just prior to my meeting him and, um, that he, he was investigating that case and, and he took me to a hypnotist up in Humble, north of Houston, about an hour north, 45 minutes to an hour north of Houston. And the lady worked with police and FBI and other similar uh, people to help them with, they would get stuck in paranoid mind states and think, you know, people would be shooting at them. So they would be looking for people to be shooting at them in that state of mind as if that somebody was about to be shooting at them all the time. They get stuck in that paranoid mind state and she would help them out of it. So anyway, um, when I went to see her, I believed, that, like most people do, that hypnosis, when you're hypnotized, you're not in control, you, you're like, you're asleep type thing. Right. Uh, these are the common misconceptions that people have about hypnosis. And I had, I had those myself when I went to see her. And so, you know, she helped me relax quite a bit, but um, I did bad things before I went to see her, you know, things you're not supposed to do. Uh, you know, things are not legal. And uh, so I was a little bit up at the time. Anyway, so the point, the reason why I bring it up is because I don't know what your conceptions about hypnosis are, whether they're accurate or whether they're inaccurate like mine were before I... See, I got it. I'm a hypnotist, or I was a hypnotist. I was... I've worked with one um, experience, uh, abductee. She was one of Daryl Sims's clients. He, uh, she went to him, I don't know how many sessions she had with him, but uh, she came to me for back pain and obesity. It had nothing to do with aliens. And after two, at the end of the second session, um, well, in the first session, I would helped her release like 3,800 events in one session. And it, it um, 
that was probably the most successful session I've ever had in my life with a, with a client. And I didn't even believe she released those things because my teacher taught me that you can only release so many things in, in one session and you become you become unstable if you release too many things. So that's why your subconscious protects you. But uh, so I was very doubtful that she actually released these things. But in this in the second session, I found out, yeah, she did actually release the thirty eight hundred plus events with her parents uh, in that first session. But there were seventy two other additional things that were um, relating to what she wanted to release to, to uh, get rid of problems she wanted to get rid of. And they had nothing to do with her parents. So I told her subconscious mind to give her the um, the knowledge of these 72 events, what they were and all that stuff. And it turned out to be her 72 encounters with the grades, 24 implantations, 24 checkups, 24 removals, 72 encounters, uh, 40 deductions, and 72 encounters, 55 offspring. And, um, and we had four sessions and she actually paid me for one of those sessions, but I wasn't charging her. It was all free. I was charging her for regular sessions, but when we got into the hypnotics, uh, the uh, aliens research, I don't charge to research aliens with clients. I just charge for regular hyp hypnosis, regular therapy. So she didn't need to pay me, but she paid me anyway because I put a lot of therapy in, I throw that in with the research. So if somebody comes to me for um, to learn about their missing time, you're going to feel much better after you're done. Even if you, even if let's say, for instance, you were, uh, and I'm not trying to sell you, I'm just telling you what the way I work or did work. Uh, if you, came to me and even if you were like Betty and Barney Hill, like you were, let's say you were like Barney, freaked out, right? And very fearful and you got in that mind state. I was talking with uh, Kathleen and uh, Martin and I told her that I didn't think that uh, Barney, Betty and Barney's hypnotist was very good because they, he, he um, when Barney started getting into an extreme fear uh, state, he never said anything to him to take him out of that state. And he could have said, I'm going to come over and touch your shoulder, and the second I touch your shoulder, all your fear will be gone. It, it, you're still sitting in this chair with me. All of your fear will be gone, and it will never return in this session or any other session. And she walked over, touched his shoulder. He's done. His fear would have all gone and he would have been fine. But he didn't do anything like that. He didn't help Barney at all. So I didn't think he was that good. Even though he might have been uh, competent in many ways, I just didn't think he really helped Barney properly. And so I said that to her, and she was very defensive. But um, the point is that, oh, but I was going to make a point. Yeah, there, here's the point. Uh, when I do something uh, research uh, like that, like I did with my client. We had four sessions together regarding aliens. And she pulled, I was able to help her get a lot of stuff that Dara wasn't able to get for her. And there were still blocks I couldn't get past, but we, we were able to get a lot of information. But um, she only knew about 24 of her encounters before she came to me. And when she left after four sessions, she knew about 72 of her encounters. So it was much more, but the point, but I, here, here's the actual point. The point is that I threw in a bunch of, I always throw in a bunch of actual um, regular therapy stuff in between the, the, um, the research so that when, if, you came, if you chose to, to come to me, uh, I would not only pull up your missing time, but at the end of the session, I, the one, only about the only thing I could guarantee you is that you feel much better after you came out than when you went in. That, I can almost guarantee that. 
Uh, that's one of the few things I can guarantee. And uh, but uh, I'm just telling you that just in case you change your mind one day and want to uh, get it through <laughs> hypnosis. So I'll put all that out just for you, and uh, I'll let you get on with your story now. So uh, it was that your what you've told me so far your only close uh, encounters, or have you had more, much more? Oh, I've had many, actually, quite a few. That was turned out to be a pretty big year. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go to your next next one, and I'm not going to interrupt. I'm just going to keep going. Oh, no, no, feel free to interrupt at any time. <laughs> no right. problem. I don't mind at all. Uh, yeah, I have considered hypnosis. I'm very familiar with it. I know it works, uh, especially if it's used in the right hands, because it can be abused, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I would say it was, let's see, just one month later in August that we decided to take a family vacation out of a large family, uh, five brothers and sisters. Uh, some have since passed away, but uh, we had gone up to the Crater Lake, Mount Shasta area, and we were camping out in the woods in a, in a campground, not a terribly isolated area, but definitely rural and uh marco and christy and i decided that we were going to stay up late in the hopes of seeing a ufo and uh, we had in fact brought a very bright flashlight uh one with a you know, large battery not a hunter's light by any means but big and uh, everyone else was asleep and these are very tall trees so we could only see a tiny portion of the sky above us when Mark shouted out, hey, I saw a light, hand me the flashlight. And I kind of thought he was kidding, but he grabbed the flashlight and, and blinked. And sure enough, this bl light blinked back at us. Now, I've, you know, it's all about science in college. Uh, I, would, I loved science. Uh, so I knew I'd taken a bunch of astronomy courses and I know what a satellite looks like and stars and comets and you know conventional aircraft and so forth. And this clearly wasn't any of those. So I was immediately intrigued. I couldn't tell how high up it was, uh, but it looked pretty high up there. Uh, so Mark blinked the flashlight twice and darned if this thing didn't blink, blink, blink back twice <laughs> at us. Uh, and that was really impressive because this felt like there was interaction there. Uh, now, Christy says it, it did it again. I was pretty sure it was just twice, uh, but it was kind of interesting. I still thought it was a little ambiguous because an unexplained light is an unexplained light. As far as I'm concerned, it's not an ET craft. Uh, but that's when things started to really ramp up for me because it was one month after that that Stephen Greer came into LA to conduct a lecture about CSETI, which is all about, you know, reaching out to make contact and close encounters of the fifth kind and initiating a sighting and so forth. Sure. And uh, yeah, if you know, if you know this field, you know, Stephen Greer. Uh, and I wasn't going to go, honestly, because he's charging too much money for me, who, you know, wasn't a rich guy by any means. And uh, the newspaper called me up and said that they would pay my way because I had written an article for them, the Topanga Messenger, some years earlier. And I'm like, oh, OK. I said, yeah, we'll pay your way if you write an article about this meeting. And uh, this is how I ended up joining the L.A. chapter of CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And after he gave his lecture, which was really interesting because he did quote a couple of my cases. He's like, here's how you call down UFOs. <laughs> here's a case from Preston Dennett that I think is really significant. And that definitely made my ears prick up because he quoted a case I'd researched in Santa Monica where a gentleman had used lights, not to call down UFOs, but as sort of a stunt for NBC. And sure enough, two UFOs showed up. And uh, that same guy, someone associated with him, 
uh, who was the guy who set up the lights actually, uh, also had another incident. So that was kind of a weird tie in there. Uh, and then that night, Stephen Greer was like, well, we'll go out into the hills in this area. We've got a location and we'll see if we can call down a UFO. Uh, so about, you know, there was probably a good hundred or more people at that meeting. And I would say about 40 of us or so, maybe 30, maybe a little more, went out to the Santa Susana Pass area to try to call down a UFO. And no sooner had we got there, in fact, when we're all gathering in this area, which overlooks the San Fernando Valley. It's a pretty rural area, but San Fernando Valley has a million people in it, at least. Uh, so I wasn't really expecting much, but somebody shouted out, hey, look up, what's that? And we had just gotten there. And of course, I looked up and right at the zenith, many, many thousands of feet up, I would estimate a good 10 or 20,000, was a very strange light. And it was about the size of a half moon, apparent size. And I mean, clearly not a satellite, helicopter, plane, balloon. I immediately dismissed all of those because it just was didn't look like that. And it moved across a few arcs of the sky and winked out. I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. That's an anomalous light that I can't identify. And the next day, a much smaller group of us went out. There was probably 15 of us. We're sitting in a group meditating when these strobes kind of came over the group. And I thought someone was rudely flashing their flashlight in my eyes and opened my eyes and I you know, saw these strobes coming from nowhere that we could discern. And over the next few years, we ended up having a good number of sightings of anomalous lights with our sort of core C-SETI group. Uh, so that was going on all this time. And it was uh, 1993 or 1994, I had a couple of my best sightings ever. And I can describe those if you'd like. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, well, what had happened was I was interviewing this lady, I'll call her Wendy. She doesn't want her real name used, but she's a contactee. She's had pretty much the full range of encounters, sightings, craft landing outside her house, grays coming into her bedroom. It was quite frightening for her in the beginning. Uh, she described having uh, ET human, you know, hybrid babies. She described being healed by the ETs. Uh, she described quite a number of really amazing incidents. One of which was she woke up and found grades surrounding her bed and she jumped up in fear and kicked one in the neck. She says his neck snapped, fell down, the other grades scooped it up and they exited through the wall. And I interviewed her about this, of course recorded the interview and I was transcribing it late in the evening in mid 1994. Now I lived in a three-story condo at the time in Canoga Park and as I'm transcribing this, I come to that incident and I remember I'm leaning back in my chair thinking, this is a lot. Is she telling me the truth? She clearly believes it. She's very sincere. She's quite emotional. She had other witnesses. I mean, she had a lot to support her case. But this was a big pill for me to swallow because I had never really heard of that. Now, of course, I have. I've heard of many other cases where people or somewhat hostile to the Greys or whomever. Uh, I remember Travis Walton described something like that. He punched one of the Greys. So I'm thinking, is she telling the truth? You know, what's going on here? How do I deal with this? And I've got this really strong, irresistible impulse to run out onto the roof of my condo. And this was strong enough where I couldn't resist it. I mean, I seriously couldn't. And it's funny because I've certainly interviewed people who described this <laughs> and it was happening to me. And I honestly didn't even realize it at first. Now, I'm slightly nearsighted. So I grabbed my glasses. I usually use them for driving. That's it. Uh, I'm not required to, but uh, I grabbed them for some reason and ran onto the roof of my condo, which I don't do. 
this it's off limits. You're not allowed to go up there. I'm a good boy. <laughs> I follow the condo bylaws, but I went up there, uh, opened the door to the roof, closed it, went to the little side building there and looked to the north over the little LA River uh, alongside the condo. And I wasn't out there more than 10 seconds, Charles, when a light appeared. And it was a large oval, orange, yellow, fiery. It was right over the apartment building, right across the way there, about two to 300 feet, pretty close, large. Let's say about the size of a small car. And it blasted me with a message, a mental message, telepathic. And it wasn't in words, but I could absolutely understand it very clearly. It was unmistakable. And it said in so many words, it's us, <laughs> War Wendy's ETs. She's telling the truth. You don't believe? Well, watch this. In essence, that's what it said. Again, not words, but the, I understood it perfectly. <laughs> like, it's us. Hello. We're real. You don't think we're real? You know, watch this. And this darn thing, which was hovering at first, kind of rocking a little bit, darted to the left, to the right, to the left, and then went whoosh, 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 back and forth, getting a little bit lower and lower each time till it was actually below treetop level and then winked out. Now, mind you, this was no more than a minute, probably closer to 20 or 30 seconds. But that's a long time if you're seeing something that unusual and that close. And I remember just kind of falling back against the wall there. <laughs> oh my, my God, what the heck? And uh, I kind of stumbled downstairs into my condo and I really wanted to call Wendy right away, but it was almost midnight at that point. So I waited till the next day and I called her up. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Your ETs showed up and told me <laughs> that you're telling me the truth <laughs> and that you are for real. And they, they wanted me to know that. And she laughed. She's like, well, of course I'm telling you the truth. What do you mean? You know I am. I'm like, well, yeah, I know. But, you know, you were describing, you know, basically breaking the neck of this ET. She's like, yeah, well, I, I understand. But that's what happened. So that was one of my best sightings ever. But. I was so unprepared that I told her, you know, Wendy, you say you're in contact with ETs, constant, right? And she's like, yeah, I can talk to them. They talk back. I'm like, well, I'd love to see a UFO. And she says, you just saw one. And I'm like, yeah, but I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, if you can talk to them, what, can't you just set it up? And she's like, well, I don't know. I can try. And we talked a little more and hung up. And she calls me back about a week later or so. And she says, OK. <sighs> are you ready? I'm like, yeah. And she says, okay, we're going to go out in a couple of days off the 210 freeway in Pasadena. I knew exactly this area very well. Um, you know, I grew up in the LA area. And I'm like, okay, that seems a little odd of a location, but let's do this. And I went with her, my sister-in-law, Christine, who does all the art for my books, by the way, and her son, my nephew, James who was about 14 or so, and all four of us park off uh, off the 210 freeway. I'm like, Wendy, this is illegal. You know, you can't park on the freeway. She's like, we have to. This is where they said to go. I'm like, okay. It was pretty late at night. So we parked, and there's a fire break, a big dirt road. Not a road, a, you know, a fire break, if you know what I mean. Bulldozed into the side of this very large hill. I wouldn't quite describe it as a mountain, but it was mountainous. And it was a good hike up to the top of this little mountain. I would say almost a mile. And so we got pretty much out of breath by the time we reached the top. And Christy and James had fallen behind a couple of hundred yards. <laughs> and we're out of view at this point because this is quite hilly. But Wendy and I had reached this little plateau. And she's like, this is where they said to go. I'm like, okay. And I'm trying to orient myself. And uh, she screams. 
and grabs my shoulders with both her hands and spins me around and says, look. And she didn't have to say look because right in front of us, I would say 30, 40 feet away and about 10 or 20 feet off the ground was this enormous golden sphere. And it was absolutely exquisitely beautiful because it had all these golden lights on it. It was covered from top to bottom, all the sides with these scintillating tiny gold lights. Now, if you've seen like a dried dandelion flower, it looked somewhat like that, but of course as big as a house, uh, a small house, you know, good 20, 30 feet across, perfectly spherical and absolutely silent and was just hovering there. I don't think I've ever seen anything so beautiful in my life. I had a camera <laughs> on my neck, but I could not take my eyes off this object. I didn't even think of the camera, honestly. So she's jumping up and down. I am just, my jaws dropped. We're staring at this thing in absolute astonishment because uh, it is so close. And it stayed there for about 20 seconds. And then it started to very slowly drift to the left about five miles per hour or one mile, then five, then six, seven, eight. And then whoosh, this thing takes off like a bullet and darts around the mountain so fast that it left a tracer of golden light that I could actually see. And it had mu must have moved about five or 10 miles in a second. And I saw it just for a tiny second as a little dot of light as it went behind the mountain. And that's when Christy and James walked up and they're like, what, what's going on? And we're like, oh, we just saw this. So that was one of my best sightings ever. But yeah, over the years, I've had a number of really close sightings. Okay, well, uh, have you gone uh, beyond craft and seen anything closer? Uh, well, yeah. Um, now that Do you ask. <laughs> oh, go for it. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I don't usually go there because people haven't asked me beyond that or we've never had time, but all right. I don't have a problem with this uh, at all. I do remember one incident while living in the condo. This was from 1991 to about 2001 that I lived there or 2004 thereabouts. And it was probably the early 2000s. And uh, Mind you, I'm having a lot of paranormal experiences at this time, too. Out-of-body experiences and clairvoyance. And I'd seen some ghosts because I was ghost hunting. Uh, you know, we can even get into Bigfoot if you want, because I've researched that and had some experiences. I'm the kind of guy who likes to experience it myself. You know, it's well, one thing. To, but <laughs> here's what I would suggest. Uh, I mean, I could have gone chronologically through your whole life and we'd be here for hours, probably more a lot longer than you would want me want to talk. But um, I'd love to hear uh, all of your paranormal experiences that you feel are important. You know, if you've had a near death experience or you've had, um, I don't know, how many how many OBs have you had, relatively speaking? OB. I know you were. I know you were getting into really into that. Yeah, I got into it in the same time I started investigating UFOs in 1986. Had read a book on it, which gave exercises. Robert Monroe's book. Right. And which which it, which one of his books? It was the first one. Uh, Far journeys, I think, was called, or Jer okay. journeys out of the body. Right. And it, it it. How long did it take you after you read the book before you were able to get out? Two months. Yeah. And how many times did you try before the uh, every, within that two months? Every night. Oh, yeah. so you did you did like sixty days. -ish. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, almost. Go through your very first time you su succeeded, and then go from there. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, I immediately started having greater dream recall. 
it started becoming really not quite lucid, but certainly pre-lucid because I would, thought I was awake and then I would wake up. I remember one time I woke up on the kitchen floor with my head stuck under the cabinet. I thought, how the heck did I fall asleep on the kitchen floor? This is not possible. And I stumbled into my bedroom and fell asleep. And then I woke up and I realized, oh, OK. <laughs> I, that was a pre-lucid dream. That was, in essence, an out-of-body experience, but I hadn't snapped to it. So I don't really count that. The first one was I was somewhat depressed. This was following the death of my mother in 1984 which was real difficult to deal with. And I was dealing with UFOs too. Okay, um, Preston, uh, we had a power outage and, or you had a power outage and you back up now, go ahead with your story. Do you remember where you left off? I do. Yeah, I just started talking about how I learned to go out of body, have astral projection after reading Robert Monroe's books or book. Initially, I've since read every book I can find on this subject. Uh, but yeah, after reading Robert Monroe's book, uh, Journeys Out of the Body, he gave exercises on how to do it. And for the next, it took me about two months. Every night I did the exercises, which if you've read the books, you know, they're basically just meditation, visualizations, affirmations, relaxation exercises, this sort of thing and started having really vivid pre-lucid dreams and uh, one day i was a little bit depressed because my mom had passed away some you know a few years earlier in 1984 and was having a hard time with it i was pretty young when she died i was 19. and uh, then now i'm dealing with ufos which was a whole new stress <laughs> because that basically destroyed my whole world view and uh, so I was just having a little bit of a adjustment period. And one day, this was during the day, afternoon, I went into my bedroom and just flopped down on my stomach on my bed to rest for a few minutes when I kind of felt this electric vibration flooding through my body. Now I thought that I had somehow stuck my finger in the light socket next to my bed not realizing that this is what uh, Robert Monroe and other astral projectors called a vibratory state. He described how when you induce the autobot experience, you might feel a vibration running through your body like a mild electric shock. But it wasn't mild, not for me. This felt like I was being electrocuted. And so I'm kind of flopping around like a dead fish on my bed, wondering what the heck is going on when there was a pop and I flew out of my body and I knew instantly at that point what was happening because I could see me in bed I had I was out of control I th flew across my room across the hallway and into the bathroom <laughs> and assumed a vertical position and grabbed the countertop and looked in the mirror and didn't see anybody there and that freaked me out. I'm like, wow, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing this. This is real. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And uh, it was just absolutely astonishing. And I was really emotional. And that kind of pulled me back into my room in a horizontal position. And I floated right over my body. Plop, fell right back in. And uh, woke up. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is real. I can't. I have to try this again. And I had my next one one week later. This was on a, a weekend usually when this would happen because I could sleep late. And I was sleeping late that morning and felt the vibrations. Same exact experience. Flew across the room into the bathroom, then floated back and plopped back in. Third time, I woke up in the middle of the night, very disoriented, standing next to my bed. And I was somewhat dizzy at vertigo. But that cleared up quickly, and I thought, what is going on? <laughs> you know, what am I doing standing next to my bed? And I became fully conscious and could see that I was under the covers. And I got this cold, deathly chill and honestly thought I had just died. I thought I was dead. 
and the dread that swept through me, I cannot, I cannot underestimate how that felt, the fear. Uh, it scared the living daylights out of me, and I dived back into my body. And it was really weird. It felt kind of like you're filling up a container with liquid almost, or settling into a mold and try to fit in. But it worked, and I fit in, and I woke up. Almost forgot what had happened, but it snapped back into my mind. And my emotions did a 180-degree turnaround. I was thrilled. I was so excited. I'm like, this works. I am doing this. And that's when I really doubled down on the meditation and the exercises. And it was, I started having them at least once a week, twice a week. And the first year of it was very difficult because I would pop out of my body and I would become overwhelmed with joy and excitement. I'm like, I did it. And I learned uh, that strong emotion will pull you right back in. So for the first year, my out-of-body experiences were no longer than five seconds, usually a second to three seconds, until one day I'm like, okay, I popped out. I'm like, just relax, you're fine. And I was stuck there in the middle of the room and I couldn't move. I'm just flat, flapping my arms and legs. I was having trouble seeing. So these were all things I had to learn. But I did through trial and error. And it, I progressed very quickly from that point where I could walk around the house, go through walls. I would usually fly up through the ceiling and hover above the house about 200 feet and just look at the fields. And we lived in a rural area. It was so beautiful. When you're out of body, everything glows slightly. And I just got better and better at it to where I could visit friends, houses, people in the family. Uh, and I would go to them. No one could ever see me. <laughs> I'd be like, hey, hey. I'd be right in front of them. And they could not see me. It was really frustrating. Uh, and just, you know, I had a friend in San Diego. I went and visited him. He didn't see me. Occasionally, I would wake up already out of body and uh, yes, for the first year, I just sort of explored the physical world. And after a couple of years, I started doing more experiments. I would call for my mother because that was my whole motivation. She had passed away and I wanted to know if there was life after death. I wanted to know where she was. And a few times she would appear to me, but that was always on her terms. And we'd rush together, I'd hug her, I'd be like, oh my God, you're alive. And she's like, yes, everything's fine. And it was very short, but I really, really wanted to see where she was. And I got to do that. One day, I'm just kind of flying around and I started calling for her. I'm like, mom, 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 mom. And I must've called her 50 times when she appeared right in front of me. And she looked young. Now, I was about 25 at this time, 27. And I was already losing my hair. But my hair would come back full and thick. And, you know, uh, my body looked real buff, you know. <laughs> I, was, I looked young and strong and just amazing. And so did she. I'm like, Mom, oh my God. And we hugged. And it was an honest-to-God reunion that would bring tears to your eyes. I mean, it's when you lose someone that you're very close to, you know how hard it is. There's no consoling you. Uh, so this was very special. And she's like, you haven't seen anything yet. And grabbed me by the hand and took me off to what we would term the other side. You know, I'm not really a religious guy, but it, she took me to a place that I would call the heavenly realms because this was green fields with trees and flowers. And it sparkled in a way that's very hard to describe. But you were embraced in love. And it was just the most beautiful pastoral nature scene you've ever seen in your life. And uh, we were flying over this field to a little brook. There's little pathways, there's little benches, there's clusters of flowers everywhere. The colors are indescribable they're so vivid so many hues and everything there glows with an inner light that you just don't see here it's as if everything is made of light there 
And she says, "Come in, come into the water." <laughs> I'm like, "You're kidding!" It's like, "No, no, no." And this was this was all telepathic, and so I did. And the water felt so strange because it was cool and wet, but it didn't get you wet. You could dip your hand in and take it out, and it was dry. It was a very strange feeling. And you know, this is just a normal little stream. <laughs> and she took some, what I guess a. Uh, moss or seaweed kind of and threw it at me and i couldn't believe she did that my mom was a little mischievous and so we ended up kind of playing in the water she wanted to show me that you know you can't get dirty and uh she says i want to show you something else took me by the hand and we went up a level so you kind of you're in your astral body but then you go to a higher vibe vibration of existence, I guess, or another realm. There's different planes, right? There's the astral plane, and there's the Buddhic, Akashic, you know, different types of planes there, the mental plane and so forth. Well, she took me up a level to this weird realm that was all crystal. I mean, it was just crystals all around us, like amethysts. And she was sitting there on this boulder, a crystal boulder, just laughing her butt off at my astonishment. And your vision there, you know, like I said, I'm slightly nearsighted. You could see a mile away. You could zoom in on anything you wanted and see it real far away. You could see 360 degrees around you all at once. I mean, I was just playing around with this and it was indescribably beautiful. I mean, it glowed with light. So she points to the ground. <laughs> she says, look. And I look down at the ground where it's crystal sand. And she turns it bright orange. And uh, she says, put that in your mouth and eat it. You know, she motioned, eat it, eat it. I'm looking at her like, you're crazy. I'm not putting that in my mouth. She's like, eat it. And so I did. I bent down and I scooped it up. And I put these crystals in my mouth. <laughs> And I don't know if you've ever had pop rock candy, but there's these little candy that kind of pop, 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 pop in your mouth. And that's what it did. But it tasted super orange. Like, I mean, I can't even describe it. Like orange juice, but a hundred times more powerful. And it was, it was good. <laughs> oh, and she laughed. And then we went back we, to the lower realm. We sat on a bench. And there were other people walking by. This is my first real major trip to this realm, and I've since had many hundreds. Uh, and she pointed to this. We talked for a while about just family stuff, my life, uh, personal stuff. And uh, it became time to go because I'd been up there for a good you know, hour or so. She pointed to the sky and says, look. And in the, she spelled out in clouds, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> and it was just, ah, oh, just so amazing. Yeah, but it was time to go, because when it's time to go, you can feel it. Your body starts to get this weird tugging sensation. And you know you have to go, or you won't ever go back. You'll stay there. And uh, I was not allowed to stay there, even though I wanted to. I was ready to stay there. You know, screw life. This is much better. <laughs> And uh, this tunnel opened up very much like they describe in near-death experiences. And I got whooshed through it, very tight and windy and bright and ended up, you know, going down several levels, stopping each time so I could remember. I actually manifested a dream book you know, because I was writing down everything that happened. But this was a dream dream book, if you know what I mean. Uh, this wasn't my real dream book. And I wrote down the whole experience and then went down another level did that a couple of times until I finally woke up in my bedroom. I'm like, wow, that was a trip. And learned how to do that fairly regularly and have since then gone up to the other side and learned about past lives. I met with spiritual masters, spirit guides, went to a healing temple, uh, other classes on psychic development. Oh gosh. I mean, it goes on from there. The so only, I only have one question. Uh, hold on a second. I only have one question 
a major question about your out of body experiences, and that is, uh, are you working on a book about them? I am. I actually did publish one already. Oh, my, really? Yeah, from my experiences all the way up to 2001, which I thought at the time were so advanced <laughs> and amazing. But I'm like, wow, I had not even scraped the surface of what you can do. I mean, you can. Uh, I went to the moon once. That was, I mean, I don't even like to tell people it sounds so crazy, but Robert Monroe did it. So I thought if he can do it, so can I. That's always been my motto because people will describe, oh, I did this or that. And I'm like, well, if they can do it, why not me? Okay, so if you went to the moon, and I'm not saying you didn't, uh, did you go to the backside to see if the aliens are there like like, like Ingo Swan said they were? Uh, no, I didn't. I was too overwhelmed, honestly, because uh, this was something I'd put on my bucket list. And this is how you can do it successfully, because if you pop out of your body and you don't have a plan and you're not focused, you will fall right back into the dream state. So it's somewhat like riding a bike or walking a tightrope or surfing even or playing a musical instrument. You have to really focus. So you get into that mindset and I'd be like, OK, I want to learn about a past life or I want to visit a deceased loved one or what have you. I've lost a lot of people over the years and I've always visited them up to the present day. Uh, so. Um, in your book, do you detail, I guess, what people really want to hear about out of body experiences more than anything else is they want to know the secret to getting out of your body. It's not so much what you can do after you get out because everybody or people who succeed in getting out um, over and over will figure that out, what to do afterwards, just like you did. But the part that we, most of us, I've gotten, I got halfway out of my body once and scared the, you know, what out of me. And I've, ha felt myself drop back into my body more than once but i've never um learned how to reliably get out so tell the audience the details of exactly you know don't just say well try it 30, 60 days and you're going to get it <laughs> be a little more specific <laughs> oh i will yeah because i have go ahead. go ahead yeah i've taught people i've taught classes i've done it very successfully with people. And it can be a very steep learning curve. Uh, and a lot of it does depend on the effort you're willing to put forth. Because it does require a lot of focus and effort and meditation. And basically what it involves is you have to sort of wrap up your intention, your imagination, your attention, your desire, your emotion, all at once, and really try to do this. I mean, if you want to be a doctor, it takes years and years and years of school to do it. So if you put forth the effort, um, you will be successful. Because, and I've learned this, and I know this is true, we are all already going out of body every night, all of us. It's all about remembering how to do it. So there's, you know, I've, there are a lot of books on this. There's a lot of literature. I've refined it. I've tried to simplify it for people. But the very first step is dream work. You really want to make a big effort to remember your dreams. This is super important because this is all about memory. So you want to get to the point where you can remember four, five, six dreams a night. And how you do that is you keep a dream book and when you wake up in the morning, you don't move. Stay absolutely still and try to remember who you were with, where you were, where you were and what you were doing. And this will start to bring back your dream life because you are out there. You're fully conscious, too. I've talked to my brothers and sisters. They're fully conscious, but they do not remember. They don't remember. And I've argued with them over this. They're like, I'm not at that stage yet. I'm like, how can you know you're out of body and not remember? They're like, I, I don't know. I don't. I'm just not there yet. So you really want to remember your dreams. Now, the second thing you want to do is 
what's called critical reflection uh, or reality testing. And that means throughout the day you ask, and this is, sounds silly, but I'm telling you this works. Throughout your waking day, ask yourself, am I out of body right now? Could this be a dream? And you know it's not, so it's kind of a silly question because when you're awake, you know you're awake. But here's the dilemma. When you're out of body, it looks so real. When you're out there dreaming, you never, it never occurs to people that you are out of body because it looks real and it is real. So you need to ask yourself during the waking state, am I out of body and test reality? And this is super easy to do and very effective. And there's some real easy ways to do this. One is to look for anomalies. Pretty much every dream you have will have at least one anomaly. It's a cue sent to you by your higher self. And it might be the driveway facing the wrong way, some furniture missing in your house, um, a window that doesn't belong there, or just some anomaly, uh, a bicentennial penny. That was one that appeared for me. I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, we don't have bicentennial pennies. <laughs> There's some anomaly in the, every single dream. Look for that while you're in your waking state. Look around the house and see if everything's in order. Second, do reality testing. And you can do this in three ways. One is to see if you can levitate or if you can levitate an object. So you might pick up a pen as such and just throw it up into the air. Does it float? No, it's not floating. Okay, try to take your finger and stick it through your desk. When you're out of body, you can pierce solid objects. Solid objects are permeable. They're not here. So you try to permeate the, the, op, the desk with your finger or the wall. You can do this very easily. And a third would be like just to pull on your finger perhaps and see if it stretches because your astral body is very elastic and you can reach as high as you want. Uh, so these are three ways to test reality. And this sounds so ridiculous. You know, jump up and try to fly. <laughs> and what will happen, and I guarantee you this is the funnest thing, and it will happen if you, per if you do this every day, at least three times a day, uh, preferably as much as possible regularly, like every time you walk through a doorway or anytime you get up or go to the bathroom, do reality testing. And what will happen is you'll be at work one day or wherever and you will say, OK, I'm going to do this stupid reality testing. This is ridiculous. I know I'm awake. And you stick your finger into your desk and it goes right through. And it, the whole environment will fall away like a house of cards and you'll realize that in fact you're hovering over your bed or you are already on the other side or you are somewhere else <laughs> outside your house. It depends because you wander around. Now, this, this is such an effective method, and I know it works, but you have to do it. So th that's what you can do during the waking state, right? But if you really, really want to do this, it's super easy. It's a basically three, four step process. When you go to bed at night, go to bed a little earlier than you normally would. Stay up or, you know, sleep in a little bit longer. Allow yourself some time to do this. And for five or 10 minutes, uh, 20 minutes preferably, uh, every single night, meditate, relax. The first step is physically relaxing. Go through your muscle groups and relax, let go. Relax, relax, relax. And there's no other way to describe how to do this other than just to physically relax. It usually takes me 20 minutes before I can start to get the bodily sensations that you need to get to. There's about five of them, and you'll feel them. One is heaviness. You'll feel like you're pressing into the bed. One is lightness. You'll feel like you're almost floating. Or movement. You'll feel like the bed is rocking. Uh, or vertigo. You might sense dizziness. Or ideally, you want to feel vibrations, numbness. You'll feel sort of a tingling sensation or numbness. And if you can feel the vibratory state, well, you're there, you're primed, you're ready to go. And that again is like sort of 
feels like water rushing through you perhaps or an electric shock or just a major vibration. So that's the first step, physically relaxing. And this is where most people fall short. People go to bed with their teeth grinding, their fists clenched. You need to learn how to relax. So work hard on that. Uh, second would be mentally relaxing. And I'm going into detail of this because this is a real barrier for people too. We have a stream of consciousness that's constantly going through our minds, even when we're awake. We have a list of all the things that we've procrastinated. We are, songs are stuck in our head. We have all the, th we're reflecting on the movie we just saw. We have this stream of consciousness that has several layers to it. And what happens is when you go to bed, you fall right into that stream of consciousness. They become images and sounds and you're in a dream. When you're awake, you're essentially daydreaming. You're that's what it's, dreams are, is this stream of consciousness. So when you go to bed, look at that stream of consciousness, recognize it, do your best to slow it down or distance yourself from it. You'll probably not be able to stop it. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but it's worth a try, certainly, <laughs> to just stop thinking. Just stop, relax, step back, and you want to get to the point where you start seeing images colors, people, you know, trees, it shapes, it doesn't really matter, but you can do this. And sounds, you can hear people talking, might hear songs, it starts to get really vivid. Ultimately, you wanna imagine light, imagine seeing light and it will flash into your eyes. And boom, you will, it will pull you right out of your body if you can do that. It's all about visualization. So you physically relax, you mentally relax. And the third step is super simple as well. Once you feel like you're relaxed enough where you're, maybe you don't even know which position your body is in, and you're relaxed enough where thoughts aren't like spinning through your head nonstop, then you focus 180 degrees inward. Stop thinking about your body. Stop thinking about your thoughts. Focus your thoughts on visualizations. And these can be usually anything that involves movement. But what's really effective is imagining yourself rolling out of bed, just rolling out. Or imagine yourself running down a pathway, jogging, faster the better. Imagine yourself spinning in place, like Wonder Woman does kind of, it's just spinning. Imagine yourself on an escalator going up, or an elevator, or on the bow of a ship going up and down, up and down, or a swing set anything with movement and that will pull you right out of your body and you're you're done you're there boom that's all there is to it okay so uh now that you've told everybody the secrets i i sort of knew a lot of those i mean the physical relaxation um have you ever laid in bed and listened to yourself snore I have, yeah, I've woke myself up. <laughs> yeah, because you're, I try to explain to people that snoring has nothing to do with uh, sleep. It has to do with physical relaxation. So when your body goes to sleep, if your mind is still sharp, you're going to hear yourself snore. It may be just the beginning of snoring, like baby snoring, or, you know, just the, the start of snoring. You're not going to hear the full thing because your mind will be too deep then, but but you can hear the snoring begin because your body's fully relaxed. You, you're going to start snoring if your body's fully relaxed, regardless of your state of mind. So that's that's an easy part. I've done that. And uh, so what's my next step? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's one thing I would also advise if you're still having trouble is what I call the love bridge. Most of us know someone who has passed away. So when you go to bed, focus on them, call on them. And if you don't have a loved one, we'll call on a spirit guide, even if you don't know them, appeal to them, because we all have friends who are out of body. But call to a loved one and say, I want to see you tonight. I really, really, really want to see you. And imagine their face. Imagine what it's like to hold them, to talk to them. Imagine their voice. They will come to you, because they're telepathic on the other side. They know they're watching over us. 
So, so of, of all the out-of-body experiences you've had, um, is the one or two or however many you wish to remember that are um, sort of like you're meeting your mom the first time, but not her, as in what I think you should do if you can remember them is to tell the most, you know, if you have, let's say you had a thousand experiences and there was three that were just way beyond the rest of them. So, so which of your experiences, if any, um, stand out beyond the rest for any reason? Uh, well, what's funny is it's difficult to answer because every time I go out, I am so thrilled. I mean, every time is like the first time in a weird way. It really is. Certainly some do stand out. I would say one was I had read about healing temples. I thought, well, that's got to be interesting. You know, people, uh, they weren't really that well described in some of these books. People would just say, oh, yeah, you can go to healing temples. I'm like, well, all right. So I popped out of body once and uh I always have a plan, you know, that, like I want to go here or there or do this or remember this. And uh, I floated above the roof of my house. I was living in Reseda at this time. And I thought to myself, what was it? What was it I wanted to do? Ah, oh, yeah, I want to visit a healing temple. And I have learned how to do this more effectively. Because I used to say, I want this or I, I want to go there. And it wouldn't happen. What you want to do is absolutely intend it so you say i go there now and that's what i did i said now i go to a healing temple most people will have guides with them who will hold their hand and you go with them and that has happened to me but often i'm i feel i should say like i'm alone i've learned that i'm not but i'm kind of a stubborn guy i like to do things on my own anyway uh, and i think in some ways you learn better so often I am alone, and I certainly felt like I was alone in that experience. And uh, something grabs your astral body when you do this. And I felt my body being propelled forward in kind of a weird spiral fashion, which is an indicator that you're about to go to the next plane of existence, you know, the other side. And I did. And I popped out into what I would term the heavenly realms, the garden realms, I guess. Is one way of putting it it's very rural again very just nature but i saw this building which was a dome-shaped building and i thought wow well that must be it because i'm heading right towards it and i thought it was small at first but then i got closer and closer and realized this was a very large building like a gymnasium or a, a what do you call it an observatory because it was sort of dark in color i'm trying to figure out what what is this made out of? Like, and it looked almost like stone, honestly. And I went inside, I, I went right up to it and I went right inside, I'll never forget this, and right to the center of this room. And it was vast, it was round, and the ceilings were very high. And uh, I laid down on my back and the floor was really unusual. <laughs> you know how an apple pie is kind of braided together on top? With a, I forget what you call it, a crosshatch pattern, I guess. It was like that, but there were these sort of metal looking bars going horizontally and vertically. And they started to move back and forth in a weird way. I laid down on my back, spread eagle, and started to spin in a circle. And I felt this energy rising up through the floor. And this was healing energy. You could feel it. And it was very powerful, almost too powerful for me to sustain. But I held on and I looked up at the walls and the walls had these filigree designs on them, sort of like ironwork, but much more delicate and far more intricate than you can possibly do here on Earth. And these were random sort of uh, not like leaves or anything, but just abstract. That's the word I'm looking for. Abstract designs uh, with shapes and stuff, but we're layered and we're moving in a weird way. And this divine light 
would shine through them on me. And I'm staring up at this feeling just absolute humility and awe and honor. And it was so, so beautiful <laughs> that I couldn't take it. I could not stand to look at it any longer. I felt like I was going to pass out just from the beauty of it. And that's what I did. <laughs> I I'd lost consciousness. I could not handle it. It was too beautiful. And I ended up waking up and I felt I could have walked on air when I got back. Um, yeah, that one was an experience I will never forget. So before you go into another one or whatever we go into next, um, obviously you felt different physically when you got back. You just said so. How long did your improved state of physicality last? A couple of days. Certainly that day was the most pronounced, but I was walking on air for a week. And I should have tried to levitate because physical levitation is absolutely connected to this. I've talked to people who have physically levitated. I wrote a book on human levitation. Yes, I've I know. Done that. <laughs> but I regret not trying it because I felt like I could have. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I've only done that once um, because there's a big, long, long list of things you want to do. <laughs> and, uh, so what I, else on your list did you do that uh, still stands out in your mind on the other side? There's a lot. Um, one experience that I really enjoyed was, uh, you know, I, would, I had this room, you know, I have a, you can see all the books behind me, perhaps, and uh, sure. I, have, I have like a thousand books. And back then, I they were all in one room, uh, which was my library. That's where I kept them. And I'd open the door, and the light would be on. <laughs> I'd be like, "How did that happen?" Because I always turn off the lights. I thought, okay, I must have left it on, even though I know I didn't. And that happened four or five times to the point where I knew I was not doing this. I'm like, huh. What is going on here? And then I walked in there again and the fan was on, the roof fan and the light. I'm like, okay, someone's here, someone's doing this. What's going on? And that's when I got a call from a lady in Maine who is a medium and a contactee. I'd interviewed her. She's in one of my books. She's like, well, you know, we talk occasionally. And she's like, oh, you should know you have ghosts in your house. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, there's two males, I think. And uh, I'm not sure what their names are, but they're friendly. They're just hanging out. I wouldn't worry too much about them. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting because the light keeps going on and off. And then I got another call from someone else who's also a contactee and a medium. And she said the same thing. So I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to figure this out next time I go out of body. So the next time I went out of body, I'm like, what was I going to do? What was I going to do? And then I remembered, let's search the house because often what I'll do is I'm you, know, you can explore the world all you want. The real fun is on the other side. It really is. So I stayed in my house and I went from room to room. <laughs> I explored the living room. I didn't see anything. The hallway, I went to the kitchen. I went to the library, nothing in there. There wasn't anyone in my be bedroom. Went into the bathroom and I'm like, well, there's no one here. And I looked in the mirror and I saw someone behind me standing in the hallway. <laughs> so I whirled around and I rushed up to this guy and I, I'm like, what's your name? Who, who are you? What's your name? He says, my name is Mac. So I grabbed him by the arm. And this is interesting because when you're out of body and you meet someone else who is out of body, they feel physical. They, if, they feel entirely real. And he did. I'm like, Mac, you don't belong here. You know, you've, you're dead. Do you know that? You need to go to the other side. You really shouldn't be in my house. Now, he's a friendly guy, you know. I am a little bit sort of impulsive when I'm out of body or maybe, I don't know, it's a slightly different state of consciousness. So I'm just, I just run with it kind of. And I kind of regret kicking him out of my house, but I did. <laughs> I pulled him out of the house. I'm like, you don't belong here. <laughs> and put him out, out front. I'm like, go away. <laughs> you don't belong here. You belong on the other side. And I went back in the house and I searched the house and there was another guy. This guy was taller, thinner, with a thinner face. I'm like, what's your name? You know, he says, my name is Bill. I'm like, Bill, what are you doing in my house? I don't know why you're here. You 
you know there's another side. You're dead. Get out of my house. And I grabbed him by the arm and I pulled him out. And that was basically it. Uh, until like a month or so later, I decided to go to one of the lower realms, not the garden realm, but there are lower realms. I'd read about like hellish realms, right? And there's it's gradations. It just gets real dark at the very lowest realms where people are just gnashing their teeth and they're in despair and they're crying and it's very difficult to be there. I don't like it, so I don't explore it a whole lot, but I have. But I went to a, a slightly higher realm, which is kind of like a mall where people sit around and tables and there's fountains and plants and but it's very urban. It's an urban setting, it's kind of like a waiting room. And I'm just walking along exploring. And I see this little kid walking with someone else and he's staring at me and I'm staring at him because he looks a little familiar. And I walk up to him. And he says, I love you. He says, my name is Mac and I love you. And I'm like, Mac, I love you too. So he was that guy. He had regressed in age, which people do when they pass. Sure. But uh, I'm like, wow, I got to see him again. And that was so rewarding because, you know, okay, I have brought people over to the other side before. This is something that you will get recruited to do if you start having out of body experiences because it's a real problem. There's a lot of earthbound souls. And I've done that a number of times. Well, some people say that, um, that when you get out of your body, um, you're in the future, you're not in the present. Have you found that to be the case? No, no, I can't say that I have, but I will say that time is different there and that you can see the future or get glimpses of it. I don't think you so much travel there. You can travel into the past. That's well, when, I, when I say the future, I don't mean like way in the future. I mean like like 10 minutes in the future or, uh, you know, an hour in the future, that sort of thing. A little bit. I mean, you get sort of, clues of that you will see things that are about to happen or will happen the next day in fact that happened a lot almost every time that would happen i would come back with a memory and it would come true so you are you are in the future kind of i'm not sure i would say it that way because time flows differently on the other side um it's all kind of it's really hard to describe um and the higher you go it's even harder to describe because you get into places that are formless and just energetic. Okay, so so how many levels have you gone down and how many levels have you gone up? Oh, God. <laughs> Relatively I, speaking. Um, well, you know, in Eastern religions, they have it all broken down to the physical plane, the etheric, the astral, the mental, buddhic, akashic, and atmic. And each one of those apparently has different levels. I mean, you can look at quantum physicists and they talk about the 12 different dimensions or whatever it is. Uh, And I can't say that I've actually counted or differentiated between a lot of these. But have you seen Ekankar's, uh, the chart that's you can, they used to have it on their website and they pulled it off and it's still available on uh, if you... You, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. It has like 10 or 12 levels uh, within the dualistic world at the bottom of the circle, below the line, and then above that, there, there's a line in the middle, and then above that, they're all non-dualistic worlds. You, yeah, you've, I've been in some very low levels where there's what I would describe demonic beings who have awful appearances that are grotesque and demonic i mean i don't know how else to put it well have you um we could spend like days going through your out-of-body experiences because there's so many different levels and things over there however uh, i guess i think humans listening to this would probably prefer to um to hear what you've experienced here because you know they may never get out of their body until they die so that's sort of a pipe dream to get out of their body it's not impossible as you know but it's easy i'm telling you it's easy 
It yeah, is. Okay. All right. Well, I believe it. So, but Anyone can do it. You don't need any special qualifications. The only three obstacles, honestly, are fear, skepticism, and laziness. Have you experienced? Have you experienced uh, any extremely ne- been the presence of anything really negative while here on Earth? Uh, in terms of an astral body experience, yeah. Well, I'm I'm talking about you could be in your body, out of your body, but you're not somewhere else. You're on Earth. Uh, well, before I even before you even answer that question, when you get out of your body, are you really in the physical plane? Or are you in a in the astral the the duplication of the astral plane that looks like the physical plane? Which do you um, think it is? Yeah, I think it's the latter, honestly. Uh, I think it's we would perceive it as the physical, but it's not exactly. It's difficult to separate the two because they are essentially the same thing. Uh, it's just the interdimensional aspect of it. Because well, once you're out of body, you're no longer in the physical world, even well, though you t- may perceive yourself to be that way. It's sort of the etheric world. Which okay. Is, so this is my uh, perception, <laughs> and from what I've read. Well, okay. So tell us about your encounters with negative beings how many how many encounters with negative beings have you had while on the physical plane on the earth plane not a lot it does happen you encounter earthbound spirits well do you have uh how many of those really stand out as in that that are kind of above the others a couple yeah Tell tell us those two or how many ever that you have now, well, one that really stands out for sure was I popped out of body and I'm just exploring the house and I'm walking around and I decided, well, let's go to the front yard. And I walked through the front door onto my doorstep and I live back then in Reseda. It's very densely populated. So houses, both sides, houses behind me, houses in front of me, <laughs> uh, lots of people there. And, you know, it's not the best neighborhood in the world. It's not horrible, but... You know, there was a person who was shot down the street and someone else was run over there and you know this is a big city kind of it's things a, happen yeah so i popped out of body and i'm in the front yard and i immediately saw three young men walking down the street and i knew that they were because you can tell by the quality of their presence real people who had passed on and were earthbound and not nice. I mean, they were thugs for sure. These guys were n- up to no good. And they were dead. And I, <laughs> I'm like, oh, shoot. And I'm, and because they were right there in front of my house. And no sooner had I looked at them when they looked at me. And they grinned with malice. You know, these guys were not nice people. Three young men. And they glided towards me. Uh, and I'm like, ooh, this is bad. And, you know, since then, I've learned how to react in a different way. But this was my first time <laughs> encountering a hostile entity of that magnitude, certainly. And they came right up to me, and I turned around, and I went right back into my body. You're supposed to, like, project love and light. And say, you know, talk to them. I was not about to do that. Well, that's that's just one theory. I mean, that isn't necessarily yeah. what you're supposed to do. Well, that's, that's, the the, that's the theory. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. So I just hightailed it back to my body and went right back in. I'm like, wow, that scared me. Uh, but I, what, what not scared scared me because when I'm out of body, you know you can't be hurt. It took me forever to fly through the telephone wires. <laughs> because I'd always fly around them. But I'm like, well, let's just fly through them. And I did. You know, you can do, you, you can't get hurt when you're out of body. Uh, so, it's non-physical. So give us another one. The, that, to me, the, okay. So I've met the kind of guys you're talking about who are still alive. Just like the three fellows you met, I've met the same type of beings, but they hadn't, they hadn't died yet. They were still in their bodies and uh, two at a time, and they had a gun. 
and they were very much still in their physical body. And so I've uh, been where you're at, sort of, but they hadn't died yet. So anyway, uh, give us another one like that one. Do you have, have you ha encountered anything that was more negative than a uh, a very bad human? Not really. I haven't. Uh, you know, I was exploring one of the lower hellish realms, and I came upon these guys who were trying to flatter me. And when people start starting to flatter you, like, "Oh, you're so great and stuff." I it always raises a red flag. And I'm looking at them, and that's I, I briefly mentioned this already. Uh, this was a very low dark realm where there's because when you're in the upper realms, everything's light. There's no shadows. It's beautiful. You're embraced in love. These lower realms are cold and clammy and dark and unpleasant and oppressive. And you have to be pretty strong to be able to do it. Uh, you have to have a real inner light about you and a real equanimity. There, you have to be very centered. So I was exercising that ability and came upon these guys who were surrounding me and not nice. And that's when they tr they were flattering me and I wasn't having it. And... Uh, that's when they transformed into demonic creatures. And I don't know if they were human or not, but they sure didn't look it. They were humanoid. <laughs> they had, you know, pig noses and claws and dark eyes and fangs and your typical sort of devilish demeanor. And I was projecting love and light and putting a shield around me of just light and that made them so mad oh they were frothing and pounding at this perimeter that i'm in <laughs> like well this is you know, this so is the the projecting I, love does work it did for me you know um, well that's a that's an excellent piece of information because if somebody succeeds in getting out of their body and they encounter something like that then um they can do what you did and they'll know it's going to work. Yeah, you can always go back. It's so easy. The problem is staying out. Uh, getting back is easy, easy. You have your silver cord. There's no problem getting lost or going too far out. Or so what, get, or anything like that. Finish that story. What happened after you gave them love? Uh, well, they really started to get so upset that I felt a little bad for them. <laughs> and I didn't want to upset them anymore. So I left. I just left. And I, and I found my brother, Jamie, who had died of alcoholism and was still on a lower level. And I was trying to get him up, but he was standoffish. I had a real hard time with Jamie trying to get close to him. Uh, last, I mean, he's now in rehab on the other side, but still a lower realm. Uh, I had another friend who died of alcoholism and I popped out of body like two weeks after he died. And he was in this dark, hellish realm, and he was screaming in agony and telling me, I, I'm not ready for this. I am not ready for this. Help me. And I said, Roger, you're going to be fine. I'm going to help you. And I wanted to take him by the hand and carry him up to the higher realm, which I've done with other people. But he was too, um, too panicked. I could not get close to him. He was too animated. Yeah, he was just out of his mind with an agony. And I could not get his attention other than, you know, I'm like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm going to help you. And so I came back and I just did prayer. I thought, well, you know, I don't know if this works. I've read it does. I'm not a religious guy, but thoughts are things. And you know this for sure when you're on the other side, because what you think will manifest around you in full living color. You have to control your thoughts because if you think it, it's going to appear, especially in certain locations or levels, I guess. So I was just there on earth, you know, awake, praying for him and popped out of body sometime later. And I'm like, Take, let's go see Roger. And I found him on a higher level. It's still what I would call the urban level. It's very much like city streets and like L.A., on a bad, bad day with traffic and noise. And and uh, he was standing behind this barrier, which I couldn't get to. 
you know, you read about this in near-death experiences, barriers and fences and borders and tunnels. And I was going through all of that. And he spoke to me audibly. And he said, thanks. Thanks, Preston. Thanks for all the love bombs. It really helped. I'm like, you're welcome, Roger. How are you doing? He's like, I'm doing okay. And this guy came at me and tried to run me. He manifested a car and tried to run me over. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? I can, because you, know, you can fly if you know how to do it. And I just lifted up and he went on and I came down and he turned around and tried to run me over again. And he's chasing me all over the place, trying to keep me from my friend. And after 20 minutes or 10 of just running around, trying to evade this guy who was being a real ass, <laughs> excuse me, but he was. Uh, and I'm like, fine, I'm just going to leave. And the last time I saw Roger, well, not the last time, but the third time, he was in the higher realms. He was in a hospital, in a bed. People were taking care of him. The colors were all real. I mean, he was in the higher realm. I said, you don't have to worry. He's going to be fine. He just needs to heal. Um, he had real bad. So what was it like on the highest realm that you've ever reached on the other side? What was it like there? Um, well, indescribable. It's like energetic lines of force. It's like colors seeping through you. You lose form. Um, I'd say the best I could describe it would be the level below that, which was the Akashic Library, which I'm sure people have heard about. This is where supposedly all, all your life events are recorded, past and future. And I'd read about it, and I'm like, I want to go to the Akashic Library, the Akashic Plane. And I hit this wall, and I couldn't get through it. It was like this dark barrier, and I'm like pounding on it. I'm like, I want to go to the Akashic. And uh, it took me a long time of scratching at it. And finally, I opened this little pinpoint, and this divine light came through it, and I squeezed through, and it filtered out every negative thought that I'd ever had. I came through it like a filter. And anything involving greed or hate or anger or lust was filtered right out of me. And I came out and I was in a very high realm, which was very hard to sustain because it was vibrating at such a high level of energy. And my mom was there. I'm like, Mom, oh my gosh. And I'm like, I saw this building, the Akashic Library. And... Uh, actually lost consciousness that first time, but went back again. And they're like, okay, you can go now. And I wanted to take my mom with me, but she's like, no, this is you alone. You have to go alone. There was a guide with me who took me across this bridge, up the steps. This is the most beautiful building you've ever seen. It's glowing with light. It's like rose quartz, but glowing. And I was just, I could have sat there on the porch and been totally happy. I was like, no, go inside. It was a huge entryway uh, with very tall ceilings, very wide. And I walked in, turned right down a corridor and right into a small room, which had what looked like windows around it or probably screens. I couldn't quite tell. I was going in and out because the energy was so high. And uh, they had me walk up. Sorry about that. They had me walk up to one of the screens and uh, it was right in front of me. And I'm looking at it when all these all these faces started flashing at me. And I knew instantly these were past lives. And it was one after another. And I'd been men, women, every ancestry that you can imagine, Asian, black, you know, Latino, all of it, hundreds of lifetimes. And then it stopped on this one that I perceived was a future life, actually. <laughs> and he stepped out and was standing in front of me. And it was this beautiful man with silver eyes and just an aura of absolute enlightenment. And that's what I've always wanted, just to, just to be enlightened, just to be okay with the universe. And I was so overwhelmed, I kind of fell to my knees a little bit. And I didn't kiss his feet, but I wanted to. <laughs> uh, and I was just, wow, I mean, I love you. You're the best. I, you know, this is, that was the best experience. That was probably one of the highest realms I've ever been to. Other than sometimes you're so far up there, I don't know how to describe it other than it's energy moving through you and emotion and formlessness and real high, high 
philosophical thoughts of infinity and oneness, yeah, absolute oneness and knowingness. It's like you are a pea in the pod of the universe. You are fitted in in a way that allows you to expand out. Um, I don't know how else to describe. There's no real words. OK, so um, before we forget, let's go back to your um, your close encounter with an actual being that you were going to tell me earlier and I cut you off. So go ahead and tell that story. Yeah, this was in my condominium complex and I was doing all this kind of astral travel and stuff. And so I'd be laying in bed and I would anyone would think I was asleep, but I wasn't. You know, and when you get to that point, you can kind of see your room <laughs> with your eyes closed. You really can. And uh, boy, that was disorienting the first few times that happened. I thought my eyes were open because <laughs> I was seeing the room and I opened my eyes. I'm like, ah, my eyes were closed. So I was in that state of mind, just lying in bed when I felt someone walking across my bed. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, it honestly felt like a cat with little soft legs. And I don't have a cat. I didn't have a cat. Uh, so I thought, huh. <laughs> and I was laying on my side and I opened my eyes and darned if I didn't see someone about that thin, you know, I mean, rail thin, standing next to my bed. And my heart beat out of my chest because I was not expecting that. And I watched this thing book it at high speed away from my bedside, out the bedroom door, into the hallway and around the corner of the living room and gone. It moved fast as lightning, inhumanly fast, which I've certainly heard people describe about grays. And it was gray, it was grayish in tone. I didn't, can't say I saw a face or even arms or legs. I saw a torso, if, if it was a torso, I don't know. <laughs> It was somewhat vague and very quick. And instead of jumping up after it, I'm, I just turned around and said, I'm going to bed. Uh, but boy, my heart was beating. That was the first time I really saw anything like that. But since then, you know, very, more recently, I've had dream recall, I guess, of being on board a craft, um, very vivid. One time I was out of body trying to get to the other side and I saw these two little black spots. I thought, what the heck is that? Because when I'm trying to get to the other side, you hit this cloudy realm that's sort of the in-between place where it's not physical, but you're not there yet. It's just clouds kind of. And I'm racing through it and these two little dark spots getting closer and closer. I'm like, well, those look like eyes. And I came right up to it and they were eyes and it was a gray big wraparound almond shaped eyes glistening big head tiny little body and it's kind of looking at me it's real cute <laughs> it's not threatening in any way whatsoever but i it was so close i was two feet away from it that and it startled me i absolutely was not expecting that in any way at all uh so i kept going <laughs> i regret that now I wanted, you know, I should have stopped and said, hey, dude, what's up? Uh, I didn't. I just kept going. Uh, so, yeah, I saw a gray once out of body. So you you almost mentioned an onboard encounter. Tell us that story, if there is one. Yeah, there's a few. I think the first one that was really vivid was remembered as a dream or an out-of-body experience, I suspect it wasn't because I found myself going to this place and I felt very, very honored to visit. And I walked in and it was a rounded room with steel walls and a steel floor and a table in the center. And I was fascinated because I'm like, wow, this looks like the inside of a UFO. And I went up to the wall and people had always described, oh, the room is rounded. And in my mind, I'd always thought, well, they're in a, an egg. It wasn't like that at all. The floor was absolutely flat, but the wall curved up to the ceiling, which was flat, which curved up or 
the floor curved up to the wall, which was flat, the wall, and the flat wall curved up into the ceiling, which was flat. So I was fascinated by that, and I looked up at the wall, and it was this sort of matte, silvery, slightly shiny, but slightly buffed, but not super chrome-like. Uh, it was more, I don't know, looks kind of like flat grayish steel, slightly sparkly. And I was fascinated by that. And I'm looking around to see if anyone's in there. And this man walks up to me and he is seven, if not eight feet tall, slender, wearing a white jumpsuit and white pale skin. And I look up at his face and I can't see it. I cannot see his face. It's blurred out. And I can't focus on it no matter how hard I try. But I recognized him because I'd seen him before. And I actually talked to him. And I, I, and I said, you know, I love you. And how before, this was an earlier experience. I'm like, how will I recognize you? He says, you'll know me because you'll have to look up at me. And I'm like, oh, OK. And it was him. It was this guy. And I think he's a tall white ET, honestly but super wise and super loving, but not like nurturingly emotional, you know, like humans. He was ju just wise, wise, wise beyond anyone I've ever met. And just fantastic energy coming off of him. And he said, would you like to see the other room? And I said, yes. And he led me into the other room and he pointed to the wall. We're actually to kind of the floor and the wall. And he says, look. And outside, it turned transparent. Uh, this was also interesting to me because I've had so many people describe this, how the wall or the floor or the ceiling will turn transparent when they're in a craft. It's not so much a window with molding. It, it becomes translucent where you're looking. And it did. And we were underwater. And boy, was that fascinating. I couldn't see where. It was just blue, frothy water. Like, wow. And I wanted to see the engine. And so he took me to this instrument, which I couldn't quite focus on again, but it looked kind of like a furnace. Um, I mean, the outside of one with, with metal slats horizontally going down. And I kind of had the idea that I wasn't fully seeing this in its entirety. But that was, in a nutshell, what happened in that experience. So how many onboard experiences have you had? Well, I've dreamt that sort of, these are mostly dreams. Uh, a few have been more waking, but I would say about 10 or 20. So my client, the one, the client that I mentioned earlier, the only, um, person <clears throat> that I've ever had as a hypnotherapy client who was used as a breeder. Uh, she, the hardest thing she, one of the hardest things she had to try to recover was just like you said, it was their face. She could see a lot of details, but when you got up to the, the actual face itself, it was hard. It was, the, it was like the last thing she got out of all the four uh, sessions we had the face was the hardest thing to get and so that kind of correlates with what you're saying but um uh of your how many onboard experiences did you say um i haven't counted i would say it's over 10 less over than 10. 10 so of these onboard experiences how many of them do you think were out of body or astral body and how many of them do you think were like, for instance, let me give you an example. The, um, one of the people I interviewed recently, very recently, she said that when she, she goes onto a big ship, what she calls a big ship, like the size of New York City, big, and uh, she kind of intimated that it's on the astral plane. You know, your, she said you're physical, just like you are here, but it's on. It's probably on the astral plane as opposed to the physical plane. So she was kind of intimating that they were coming from that higher level, and that's where they existed. Now, uh, so I would ask you, 
of all the 10 experience, 10 plus experiences you've had on the ships, how many of them were out of body? How many of them were, were you, were your physical, where your physical body was there? And, or how many of them were in a state where you're not sure which one it was sort of thing? Um, yeah, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could answer that with a little more. Uh, well, no, I'm not saying I'm not, you should have authority, but give give me your doubts. Give me uh, um, give us. Well, yeah, your, your understanding. Um, I'll just my thought. I mean, this is how I'm interpreting it. I feel like they're physical. OK, go ahead. Um, I really do. Having researched this subject so much. Uh, but I do feel like when someone's on board a UFO, it is in a way interdimensional because you are on sort of a higher. They, they, these UFOs can master that. They can take that physical ship to what we would call the other side. And you are in a way on the in that dimension, but you're still physical. You're not in your room. I've talked to far too many people who people were looking for them and they're not there. Uh, so I feel like the onboard UFO experience is by and large a physical experience because people are being healed. People are being so, implanted. So of these 10 experiences, how long would it take you to tell the maximum number of details of all 10 experiences? How long would it take? Oh, gosh, it would take probably I don't an, know, hour? an hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we've got a, almost an hour. We've got about... Uh, Let's see how many how many minutes did we lose before? It's like twenty five minutes or something. Um, something like that, yeah. I, I I can't go too much longer, but if you'd like, I can go a little. Well, I'll tell you what. I tell, have dinner. <laughs> tell us um, whatever experiences you haven't told us that, and this could be an onboard experience. It could be uh, a non onboard experience. But we want it, the audience wants to hear the most interesting experiences you've had, regardless of, you know, you don't have to go into great detail on all of them. You could go, you could like give the the meat of several of them or however you want to do it. Uh, go as long as you feel like going and give as much as you feel like giving. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, um, push you beyond what you want what to do. So. So you're talking UFO experiences or astral? Or anything. No, it doesn't have to be UFO. Just tell us the most interesting experiences you've had of any kind, of any kind, that are uh, that you feel the people would want to hear. Doesn't matter what they are. <laughs> okay. Um, Things that stand out in your mind. They could be on board. They could be paranormal. They could be out of body, higher realms, whatever, whatever you think really will catch people's ear. Well, one experience that, you know, I think I would like to share because this is something that will happen to you if you start going out of body and meditating and connecting with ETs is your psychic abilities wake up and you start having telepathy and clairvoyance and all these kinds of things. So what happened for me one day, which was really amazing, was I was going to, the, I was driving to the bank you know, and this was a time where I, I would dream something and it would come true the next day over and over and over again. I was having precognition and telepathy. You know, I would hear people's thoughts and then they'd say one thing and think another and I would come out garbled. I'd be like, what did you just say? <laughs> because it was confusing. But at any rate, I'm driving to the bank and I'm, it's not far from my house, but as I'm a couple of streets away, a vision came into my mind's eye of a tall gentleman with shoulder length hair, bare chested with a leather uh, vest, lots of tattoos. This is a kind of a biker dude kind of guy, mustache, beard, and a little thrashed looking. I mean, he looked almost homeless, I guess. Um, he looked a little scary and he was whipping his hair around <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, this is something that's popping into my head. And this is how you know, I learned just let thoughts come in. This is how you listen and 
get psychic visions is pay attention to what's going on inside your head. And I thought, well, this is weird. And as I got closer and closer to the bank, it, it really became very vivid. And I thought to myself, if I come around that corner and I see that guy, <laughs> I'm not going to the ready teller, you know, the ATM. <laughs> and of course, I went around the corner, turned into the bank, turned to the next corner up to the ATM, and he, there he was, standing in front of the ATM, whipping his hair around, exactly like I'd seen in my mind's eye. That to me was a clear warning, do not approach that man. He is trouble. And I didn't, I waited till he went away. Uh, but that was so cool because I was like, wow, I saw that ahead of time. So I've had a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, I think that's, I love that when that happens. But you attribute your greater psychic ability to your getting out of your body? I do, because that's it came hand in hand. Uh, whenever I would have an out-of-body experience, I would also have a dream, which was precognitive, of like going to work, and I, I, like I dreamt my boss came running up, saw a UFO. It was bright, it was yellow, it came right up to us, it was amazing. Oh God, it was the best experience of my life. And I went to work that morning, and... My boss comes walking up to my, my desk and says, you're not going to believe it. I saw a UFO. It was oval, it was yellow, it was the most amazing. I mean, word for word, what I had dreamt. There was only one difference. Is in my dream, I thought he was telling the truth. He wasn't. He was joking. He was just pulling a fast one on me, which, you know, he was smiling the whole time. So I knew he was joking. But otherwise, it's absolutely accurate. Another time I dreamt I got attacked by a baby goat. It was a very weird dream. And sometimes you know, when you have dreams, you can analyze them. They're usually hopes or fears, desires, or some, some issue that you're working through, or a movie you perhaps saw. There's different levels, but most are, relate to something in your life. But this didn't. I'm like, what the heck am I dreaming? Because this goat came running at me hard and knocked me over and it was pounding me. It was a little goat. I thought, I don't know what this dream means. I cannot interpret this. And it had that weird sort of super vivid and cohesive quality because dreams can skip around and be very mercurial. This wasn't. This felt real. But I'm like, hmm, this couldn't happen. I'm not going to be attacked by a goat. This is just not going to happen. But I turn on the TV. And there was a news story about a guy who had been attacked and killed by his pet goat, which he had abused. <laughs> so uh, that, to me, was precognitive because you know, it has to have enough elements that are very specific for me to say this is precognitive. It has to have that feeling, like I've seen this before. So did you, your, of your 10 onboard experiences... Um, is there one or more of those that stands out amongst the rest that that um, maybe was more exciting or gave more details or gave some information about the aliens? That, that, uh, some are somewhat fragmentary, but one does definitely stand out. Okay, go ahead. Where, uh, and I was, you know, now I'm in my 50s, but this I recalled, and I thinking this might have been during my missing time encounter in, in my 20s because I was young in this experience. But I remember it, and this I feel was real. Uh, and I was in a large circular room with a bunch of other young men, and we were paired off at little tables. We were uh, being uh, taught about energy sources. And each room had a little device that was sort of what we would call a free energy motor or something along those lines. And I remember looking to see if I could find, you know, plugs or outlets or where the source is coming from. And there was none because these were in each was independent. And I was fascinated because the room was different. And there was people around the edges who were supervisors. And I didn't really get a good look at them. So I couldn't say that these were ETs, but the room was rounded. It had everything that, you know, I mean, it's, it, 
it felt to me like it was a UFO inside of a craft. And then we, you know, the lesson was finished. I'm kind of going in and out because I wasn't, I don't have full recall of this, but the lesson ended and we were like, okay, now it's, we all want to show you something. So all of us were gathered together. There was 30 of us or so. And uh, we went to the wall, which turned into transparent onto a balcony. And we all stood on this balcony and the wall peeled away and we were in outer space and there was the Milky Way. And you may have seen pictures of the Hubble telescope or the Webb telescope, which show the Milky Way in all of its glory. That's what it looked like, but it doesn't compare to when you're there seeing it with your own eyes without any atmosphere. It was the most beautiful thing. <laughs> and it was so, so bright and beautiful. And it was a sea of stars. It was so amazing. It was just, just amazing, incredible. <laughs> There's no real words. It was magnificent. I guess that would be one way of putting it. <laughs> Uh, just a waterfall of stars. It was so beautiful. So is there any other experiences you want to relate that come to mind that uh, you don't mind uh, speaking about, or would you just rather give a parting message? Which which do you prefer? Um, well, I am going to have to get going because I do have to eat. Sure. Uh, but uh, we can finish this another time. Uh, I just, this is your opportunity to either promote a book or give a message of wisdom or tell uh, an, an experience that just puts itself right in your mind at this moment. Whatever is your preference for your last couple of minutes is whatever you feel like saying. Well, I would encourage everyone to try the exercises I outlined earlier. Uh, have no fear. You're not going to get lost or locked out of your body or possessed. Astral projection is as safe as sleeping. It really is. You're already doing it. Just try and don't give up because you will succeed. And it's all about the effort you put forth. Uh, so that would be my message just to walk in love and compassion and do your best to develop your psychic abilities because that will do it. And I'll just leave you with one really cool experience because last year my nephew, my young nephew of age 40 died. Uh, and uh, that night I had an out-of-body experience where I was pulled down a tunnel of light. I really wanted to see him. And there were people in that tunnel who had just passed away. Some were stuck in the tunnel. Uh, but I popped out on the other side into a waiting room that was filled with people who had just died. This was the COVID era. And uh, there was a la lady who was a greeter at a desk, a beautiful lady with dark hair and dark eyes and a big smile. And I walked up to her. I'm like, I don't know if you can help me. My name is Preston. I'm looking for my nephew. His name is James Dennett. Could you, is he here? Could you help me find him? And she smiled. She's like, yes, I can. Turn around. He's right behind you. And I turned around and there was James. And I'd forgotten. He's like six foot two. I hadn't seen him in a while. <laughs> he's a tall man. And he was so healthy. His chest was thrust out. He was glowing with light. And he was smiling from ear to ear. And I grabbed his hands. I'm like, James, oh my God, it's great to see you. I love you. He said, I love you too. I said, how are you doing? He says, you know, I'm actually doing really good. I'm really, I'm fine. I'm just fine. Mind you, he had died like less than 24 hours earlier, 12 hours earlier. And I'm like, wow, you know, you look so good. And I wanted to ask him more, but he started talking. He's like, Preston, I want to tell you something. Uh, I watched your YouTube videos. I've been watching them. I'm like, really? <laughs> He's like, yes, I love that one you did about that kid who saw the UFO with the yellow and blue lights. Uh, this was about a kid who got an alien implant and his mom saw grays. And I knew exactly which one he was talking about. 
And he's like, I love that one. He says, you're doing such a good job. You really need to keep doing this. What you're doing is really important. It's more important than you know. Keep doing this. And I was so overcome with gratitude and love that it pulled me back. Uh, and uh, But I did get to tell his mother. <laughs> I'm like, listen, your son is fine. I saw him. because She knows that I, I do this. And she's had a few out of bodies herself, not as many as me. But yeah, you can meet your deceased loved ones. This is that alone is worth doing it. Uh, so that's I would encourage people to at least try it. It will change your life. You can thank me later, but at least give it a try. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, if you ever feel like coming back and spending more time and telling more onboard experiences or more higher realm experiences or more of anything that you feel like, you know, even if you want to come on to promote your books, I'm, I'm good. Whatever you want to do, uh, I think you have enough uh, things that you haven't told that we could keep this going for another couple of hours easily. Uh, but I know you want to eat. So uh, thank you. Let me go ahead and stop the recording. Here we go.